All right. Um, welcome to one of our, probably the last session officially. But we have the video game session later, so don't forget about that. Uh, so this is our session, Accelerating Ocean Impact Through Digital Platforms. I'm Leonardo Valenzuela Perez. and the program director of uh, Global Ecosystem for Ocean Solutions at uh, Ocean Visions. And uh, this is probably one of my favorite panels for uh, for the conference. Uh, no offense to the, the rest of the presenters here, but um, this is uh, an issue that ten tends to be overlooked at uh, scientific conferences, but there is a key role for scientific communication. So. Digital platforms have definitely become uh, a fundamental tool for scientists, innovators, and activists working at the intersection of uh, ocean and climate issues. And these platforms allow for massive reach and exposure and direct engagement uh, with diverse audiences uh, with a strong potential for meaningful collaborations and coalition building. And they also offer a great opportunity for accessibility um, using multimedia resources to uh, reach broader audiences. There are many challenges to carve and sustain a space in today's digital landscape. Uh, however, there are some excellent uh, positive examples of success that are worth examining and to guide our own explorations and to eventually scale up the impact of ocean solutions collectively. And today we have an incredible panel um, with uh, Samantha Garwin, who will be joining us online. Uh, Director of Market Development at GreenWave. Uh, we have uh, Elizabeth uh, Liz Scher, Marine Science Communicator and Content Creator. Anna Madlener, Founder in Residence at Marvel and host of the podcast The Ocean Embassy. And Sophie Silkis, uh, Associate Marketing Director at Sustainable Ocean Alliance, SOA, SOA, whatever you however you know them. Uh, we will start with uh, brief introductions uh, by each of our panelists, uh, followed by an in-depth conversation. And after that, we will open the floor uh, for audience questions, and we will have, in the end, some final remarks from our panelists. So to start, we have this uh, three-minute introductions, and um, we will start with uh, Samantha. Yes, uh, so we have Do you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes. So could you give us some uh, awesome. remarks here? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everyone. My name is Sam Garwin. I'm delighted to be joining you today. And uh, I am the director of market development at GreenWave. And prior to my current role, I was actually a consultant with the organization and was responsible for bringing our regenerative ocean farming hub from idea to reality. And so this involved drawing on my background in enterprise software to get the platform designed and built and working closely with GreenWave's co-founder, Brent Smith, to ensure that the hub would truly further GreenWave's mission and embody our organizational values. So rather than describe it for you, though, I have a little video, a trailer for the hub, uh, so you can see what we ended up with. So give me one second while I figure out this screen share. I think we can pull it out from here, uh, Sam. So. Hi, here we go. If you're just starting out and thinking about building your own regenerative ocean farm, it can feel overwhelming, it can feel stressful. You're going to have to learn a new trade, build a business, and grow a blue thumb over time. That's why we've designed GreenWave's Ocean Farming Hub. It's a seed to sale resource built by and for ocean farmers. For years, GreenWave has been out on the water learning from farmers around the U.S. and world. And we've crystallized these practical skills and the lived experience of the GreenWave network. The hub is a free resource. You'll discover interactive farm designs, budget tools, gear lists, how-to videos, all those nuts and bolts you need to get out on the water to grow into a successful ocean farmer. Once you've gotten your feet wet, you can join our online community where you can find answers to your technical questions and then collaborate with other farmers, continuing to learn and innovate. At GreenWave, we've seen this incredible community of passion build up around ocean farming. It makes sense. It's one of the cornerstone solutions in the fight against climate change and building a just economy. Now, it's time to turn this community of passion into a community of practice. 
We're excited to go on this journey with you as we build a future where we can all make a living on a living planet. All right, that's it. I look forward to chatting with you all more about it. Is it? Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Sam. And we have next uh, Liz Scher. Do you have a presentation or Liz? Or Liz? Hi everyone, I'm Liz, or Liz Living Blue, and I communicate ocean science in action. So a quick background about me, um, I always felt like my deep connection to the ocean and sustainability was something strange and innate because I'm from suburbia, New York, but I was always passionate about the underwater world from watching documentaries or reading books, and also about plastic pollution, having witnessed... Oh, thank you, I'm a little short here. <laughs> Um, also passionate about plastic pollution, having witnessed it around my neighborhood as when I was young. And so fast forward to university, I studied natural resource conservation at the University of Florida and minored in extension education. And then I moved on to Europe where I was fortunate to study in a master in marine science in Spain, France, and Belgium. And throughout my studies, I realized or understood this, um, miss this gap in communication with science and the rest of the world, as we all know, and I wanted to be part of fixing that gap, but I wasn't quite sure yet how, until I moved to Barcelona for work, and I went to the beach every morning, because I just love the ocean, and I would see the uh, beach covered in trash every single day. And so naturally, I started doing beach cleanups, and uh, I thought to myself, this makes me feel better, but I think this needs more people to see, and we need more impact so I started doing uh, TikToks uh, with cleanups and I made a challenge saying that um, I will pick up a certain number of pieces of trash and uh, because I believe the motto that every piece of trash counts. And I asked people watching my videos, you can help me with this goal. So I started getting comments of people saying, hey, I picked up 25 pieces of trash from, from Greece and I, me and my sister picked up 100 pieces from Canada. And this idea kind of went viral of people picking up trash around the world uh, with this collective goal. And so this got the attention of the European Parliament who one day messaged me on Instagram actually saying, hey, we love your, your work on TikTok. Can you help us with a campaign for World Ocean Day 2021? And we made a similar project with that and it encouraged people from 33 countries to pick up trash around the world for World Ocean Day. And as much as I love picking up trash, I also want uh, to really make people fall in love with the ocean so that they can actually care about the ocean. So my videos really scale in storytelling with education, action, and impact among different kinds of topics. So here are some of my favorites, for example, with the trash challenge on the left that has over a million views. And recently I was in the Canary Islands with a nonprofit organization and we did an underwater cleanup near a golf course to pick up the golf balls. And we've collected 600 golf balls in about an hour. And this video was now their most viewed video and it brought a lot of awareness to this issue that no one really thinks about. Um, I also share ocean stories and um, fun facts about marine life. Also when I was in the Canary Islands, I found this bubble snail in the tide pool and it was so cool for me because I always wanted to find this species and I realized <laughs> this was my first viral video on Instagram as of a few weeks ago with over 700,000 people as excited about me as for a bubble snail. So uh, people really get, people want to see these ocean stories and of course also educating about ocean news and science through uh, campaigns like Sargassum Solutions and actually I've seen some people from this conference who are part of that video just from my research about sharing solutions. And so um, this helped 
build an online community of around 130,000 people so far across all my channels, uh, using social media for good and for the oceans. And what I've learned from that is that people really want to learn about the ocean, but they want it to be in easy, easy to understand and digestible ways. People also want to help protect the ocean, but they need some guidance. And people want to have hope for the ocean. So there's about 100 or more solutions from this conference. And everyone wants to know about what science and researchers are doing to help protect the ocean amongst all this climate doom. And so I'm actually working on a series called Together Living Blue, where I'll be sharing ocean positive ocean stories and solutions with my audience and platform. So if you have, like, if you want to be part of that, let me know. And um, <laughs> yeah, follow me on Lizarding Blue, and I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Liz. Um, next we have uh, Anna. Chatting to people is. I will pause that. Um, hi, thanks for having me. Um, I will keep it short. I think um, the, I host a podcast that's called The Ocean Embassy, um, and I'm a marine robotics engineer by training. And similarly to Liz, I was just really frustrated, I guess, by a lot of people not really understanding what we do um, and how important every individual is in the ocean um, when it comes to the ocean. And uh, I took that and created a podcast called The Ocean Embassy, and I will just do this. Eh, there we go. Chatting to people is important, especially between Southern and Northern Hemisphere. The idea is really to build the connection so that it's kind of long term. So what is the country's needs when it comes to deep sea or marine biology or something like that? And realistically, how can we make those things happen? Deep sea, it's typically in the academic circles thought of as deeper than 200 meters. That's actually about 93% of our oceans. And the majority of our oceans is relatively inaccessible. I get to create the technologies to get us down there and ask questions that we didn't even know to ask five years ago. There's a difference between the digital ocean and the digital twin of the ocean. There will never be one twin. The twins will always be focused on the set of questions that you might have. Whereas with the ice above you, it's almost like peaceful. In the winter, it gets to almost like 24 hours of darkness. In the summer, it's 24 hours of light. It's like photosynthesis on the land, but instead it's chemosynthesis underwater. Alkalinity is just a sponge for atmospheric carbon dioxide and it sucks it up and stores it safely chemically in seawater. I mean, I don't say we have understood all of the chemistry, but I'd say the chemistry, we have it better under control than the biology. And if you rely on biology to remove carbon, there is just a higher chance for surprises. A precautionary principle, is, which is that we shouldn't do things um, without knowing the consequences of what we're doing from an environmental standpoint. For me, it's no point in creating laws that are ineffective. So to create effective laws, you need to interact. With oceans, again, because of this long tradition of thinking that the ocean was too big to fail, that the ocean was too big to like take care of itself, um, and that everybody had access, so I might as well just go and take the biggest part before others come and take it away. We need to make sure that we compare those environmental impacts with the impacts of climate change and not with, with an ideal scenario of a pristine ocean. I think it's also important to agree to a certain ethic uh, that we all agree, okay, we're doing this and we're trying to do this to mitigate climate change and save our planet, but if we see that the consequences are worse than climate change, then we should just stop. It's important though that we do create an understanding of what happens when we leave something alone. And Aldabra is being described as a natural laboratory. So, you know, somewhere where you've seen heavy exploitation and but Aldabra can show that, you know, that is that is possible. It's not a pipe dream. It, it, it's, it's being done in that sense. You give nature a chance and it replenishes itself, it rejuvenates. Thank you. And now we
we have uh, Sophie. So. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sophie Silks with Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, or SOA or SOA. Um, we accelerate solutions at the Ocean Climate Nexus through our grants program and through an accelerator program with a focus on uh, supporting entrepreneurs and young ocean leaders all over the world. Some of you are part of our ocean hubs. Um, and also we have some mentors in the audience, including Brad, and we're grateful for that support for our network. Uh, just a quick overview of some of our impact. Uh, we released our impact report about a month ago, so this is a, a, the new solutions total. It was 266 as of the end of December. Now we're at over 300 solutions that we have accelerated with headquarters in 77 countries. Um, we have made 1.6 million in investments to our grants and our startups. We have 165 countries represented by our leaders, 82 hubs, uh, over 600 blue jobs created through our startups. And these startups have gone on to raise over 300 million in investment capital. So we're proud of what they've done. Um, and then I have a little video to play just from uh, the Our Ocean Youth Leadership Summit, which we hosted in Panama about a month ago. Um, just leading up to the conference, it was an opportunity to bring about 77 youth from around the world together for an innovation hackathon um, to meet one another and actually discuss some real uh, ideas leading up to the conference about activating ocean climate solutions. We are here at the Our Ocean Youth Leadership Summit and we are so thankful to the Panama government, to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and to the Our Ocean Conference organizers for making this a reality. It was the first time the youth leaders actually had the opportunity to make their voices heard and most importantly, to bring their ideas to life. connect to people. I think we have ideas that can change things. This year, we are collaborating together with Sustainable Ocean Alliance to do this prestigious, very important event that brings together youth delegates from around the world to find solutions, innovations, and simply create leaders for the future towards the protection of our ocean. When you think of the blue economy, you have to tackle pollution, climate change, you have to tackle maritime, fisheries, etc. Because we really can't keep operating in silos, we have to connect the dots in order to come up with meaningful solutions. The Youth Conference really represents an opportunity to empower incredible young leaders who are fighting for oceans for our communities, give them more of a seat at the table so that we can ensure that our generation and future generations have a better planet than the one that's being handed to us now. I think youth have the ability to be the boots on the ground. And I think we have that energy and that capacity to see those differences and come up with creative solutions for bridging that gap. It's about advancing new ideas, advancing um, new solutions. Seeing so many people that care, that is really inspiring. They are willing to devote their careers, their, their talents to make a change. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Sophie. Um, so just to get this started, we had a, a very broad overview here of uh, all your activities, and I think we still have Sam. Uh, so just to start, and, um, and this is something that crosses probably all, all your work is, uh, and considering our audience today, 
why would you say it's relevant for scientists and innovators in the ocean solution space to use build digital platforms? I can start. Um, I think it's been mentioned quite a few times in the last few days by panelists who were talking about their um, scientific, technological policy solutions, how uh, it's really difficult to actually explain to people who don't work in this field what they're doing. I remember someone was sitting on the panel, on the financing panel and they said uh, it takes them 10 minutes just to even explain to friends what the hell they're doing. Um, there was mentions about um, needing to engage with local communities to even get projects off the ground. And I, I think it's when I speak to people about ocean-based carbon removal, they are, they, there's a disconnect and it's so hard to understand what, what, what we're doing. Um, and I think these digital platforms, especially platforms that you can engage with for free, um, are so crucial in making sure that what we may all be aware of in this group of like 300 people um, actually gets transported out to, to the public and to people who will be way more um, decisive in whether a carbon removal uh, effort, for example, gets implemented than, than we might be. Um, and I think it's quite, quite um, indicative also the fact that um, there is a lot less interest often on panels such as this as well. Um, but it's so, so, so important to transmit that, that message to people to actually get their approval. And I think especially in the ocean, it was mentioned a couple of times how um, it, people get a lot more careful and afraid when we think about tampering, quote unquote, uh, with the ocean as opposed to doing direct air capture on land. Like, talking about carbon removal a lot because that's my field but um yeah i think it's it's really important to explain that what we're doing is um safe in that regard or it's important it's necessary and no one is going to read papers no one is going to read really complicated articles if they don't have a background in that field yeah for sure i think um to echo on that that digital platforms offer a great way to scale uh, everything that we're learning in these conferences and these solutions to wider audiences. It also has the potential to make these partnerships that we're always talking about we're lacking because um, using these platforms, you can really reach different organizations, young people. It doesn't even matter uh, the generations, like just people who have an interest in this or want to know more or who somehow the algorithm brings you to that. Um, and I think like I even have many digital connections that I made from these videos uh, that I haven't met in person, but we all support each other of different people picking up trash around the world or different kinds of creators working on climate solutions and um, building these communities around the world really makes like a bigger impact to support each other and to, as you said, like bring what we're learning here just outside the conferences to the greater public and more. Um, yeah, I want to also kind of expand on what the idea of digital platforms means, because I think sometimes it's one dimensionally, I mean, social media is critical. Um, I think it's important to also keep in mind really basic things like websites um, and pieces of media like videos. And kudos to this panel for having amazing trailers to all of our introductions. You can tell we're communications people. Um, but I think for me, one of the things I love about working in communications is it forces you to uh, kind of distill the essentials of complex ideas into something that makes sense to various audiences around the world. And that process, I have been a part of so many and it can be existential, it can be terrifying. Um, and at the end, you're left with a message that is resonant. Um, it makes sense, it's tailored to audiences and that translates really beyond even kind of your social message sometimes. Mm -hmm. It becomes the thing that you reach for when you're introducing yourself to new people. It's the thing, the tagline on your website. It's something you post about on LinkedIn. Um, so it just becomes kind of part of your personal narrative. So it's, it's social media, it's also websites, um, just beyond, beyond the things we usually reach for. So you <laughs> have something to Yeah. Add. Yeah, those are all 
Amazing points. I would I'll just add that um, you know each each new generation is relying on digital technology more and more, and it's really no longer optional to have a digital presence if you want to be relevant. And so, you know, every, we need to meet our communities where they are, but almost everyone is spending some time online, and so it makes a lot of sense to also deliver content that way. And I'll also say that I think of selling climate smart solutions, whether those be products, crops, services, whatever, we are selling these ideas to people. We're trying to convince the, the average person that even though something might be less convenient or more expensive right now, that it's the right choice. And so I think we really need to think about how do we make these choices competitive with the status quo, uh, you know, in all these big companies, all these big industrial uh, ways of doing things, they all have digital access, they have great user experience, you know, we we need that too, if we want people to realistically consider adopting, uh, um, you know, changing their behavior. Thanks, Sam. And going into more practical question, if you want, uh, and given your experiences, how do you cultivate audiences and communities in a way that has potential to build meaningful action. I really like the idea that you had, the word that you used there, community, because I think in the end, we all are connected to the ocean. Even if you live in a landlocked area, your impact matters from rivers to mountains, everything connects to the ocean, but people still are not understanding that connection. Um, and so kind of like bringing all this science and all these solutions just to like, just making it more relatable to your everyday life and showing people how how what you do, your habits, your habits can change, can make an impact to the ocean, but also from the, the products that we have or even scaling to uh, learning more about the ocean. Um, and using even words like third person, saying we, not just I do this, I do that, making it more um, welcoming. So using addiction that is welcoming into like we can change this or also asking people in your community like questions at the end of your blogs or videos or podcasts so that they can respond and engage and reflect on what they just learned about yeah i think there's a piece of it too i love the, the touch on community i agree that's a critical word um i think we rely on ourselves also a bit too much to be the ones that drive the conversation um give ourselves too much credit sometimes for or maybe it's kind of take on too much of the burden of um starting and ending a conversation when we're in a space of communicating an important idea to the communities we care about um, and I, I think there should be a focus on kind of shifting that burden a little bit and turning it into an opportunity for our audiences to kind of break out into conversations among themselves and to take on discussion points and actually take what we're offering as information and apply it in their own context and kind of engage with other people about what it might be like in their other areas. You know, at SOA, we're working on a new kind of digital community platform. We have thousands of members all over the world. Um, and it's a big challenge just thinking about, yeah, we, we have what we kind of want to say, but also our mission is really to just provide the tools and the seeds of conversations to really create meaningful action that is completely relevant in a local community that we may not know much about. So it's like provide the tools, the kind of venue for the discussion, um, and then the support along the way to help scale those solutions as, as they go. I think, um, Touching on that word of community, I kind of would consider and think of everyone that has been here the last couple of days as a community. I heard people say that a lot, like it's such a great community to talk with, etc. Um, but it's 350 people, I don't know. Um, and there is so much, there's so many more ocean experts, ocean scientists, ocean technologists out there. And something I notice a lot with the podcast um, and something that motivated me to do it was actually um, how often I speak with people who are, for example, working on deep sea technologies, but are completely disconnected from ocean based carbon removal. I, I, I think um, it was doing the keynote from, no, I don't know who. Anyway, um, uh, there, even within the ocean community itself, within ocean professions, there is such a disconnect um, between people talking with each other. And I, I remember one of my, or the most listened to episode of my podcast is the one on ocean alkalinity enhancement. 
and just judging by the shares and who talked about it online, I could tell that it was actually mostly people uh, working within this topic, work, when, working within this community, who were thankful for finally having a, an explanation of what is ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, and on, it, it can touch that community, but then it also translates to a broader um, audience. And um, when it comes to inspiring people to actually go into ocean professions, I think that's where we can also have a huge impact. Um, so something I do on the podcast, for example, is to always ask an individual and the person how they got to that particular ocean profession, what drove them to do it. And it's such inspiring stories and interesting stories and can have a huge impact on people who are thinking about what am I going to do with my career or who are maybe working in a specific ocean area already um, and are then inspired to go into a different ocean area. Um, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Sam, do you want to add something here? Yeah, um, building on the conversation about the word community, I think in, in the trailer you heard Bren talk about multiple communities. We talk about a lot about this community of passion and the community of practice. And we really think of our digital platform, the, the Regenerative Ocean Farming Hub, as a funnel. So most mainstream folks probably are not taking action. That's just where they are right now. And that's okay. We're going to focus on, we have certain content on the hub that's focused on engaging the mainstream people and just bringing them into the community of passion. So can we get them to care and can we funnel their energy and attention and funding to the cause broadly? And then we think about how do we narrow that community of passion to the community of practice, which are the people who are actually doing the work and who we want to serve with our programming to help them be more successful ocean farmers. And uh, so, so we think about that, that narrowing and, um, and then, you know, once we think about, once we have them down there to the practitioners, then we have to engage them on a much more kind of tangible level because we need to give them what they need. They're busy, they're working on the water. And so uh, I will just say that in terms of engagement, we have had to have, take major shifts within GreenWave to incorporate our own tool into our workflow. So if we don't use our own tool, nobody's going to use it. And so we all have time blocked off on our calendars every week to go into the, the forum section of the, of the hub and actually interact with people in that space. And we really also use it as a listening tool so we can have a finger on the pulse of what are people talking about? What are they uh, what are their pain points and where might be we be able to support them better? Thanks. Do we going to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that also I think going outside your comfort zone and reaching out to other people right next to you and to learn more about what they're doing and like all these ocean issues and solutions are all connected and like if we can get different groups together in the ocean science community, if you want to make an event with a group that is maybe related, but you know nothing about what they do or a blog or a video or anything. Um, combining your audiences that are focused on the same issue or combining your audiences to get bigger impact and just like learning from each other and really honing on that, I think is important too. Yeah, I just wanted, to, I, with GreenWave, we're doing the exact same thing, kind of blocking off time to be like, we have to go use Mighty Networks to understand how everyone else is experiencing it. So it's true, like the learning curve is steep in terms of these digital tools and uptake, um, both internally and also externally. And um, love, love the community focus. I think one thing that I don't sometimes forget about and I, I sense when I feel there's a kind of a barrier between I'm looking at something I'd love to be engaged with I don't know how to get involved I see really generic calls to action that are like reach out or like let's partner I think we need to get specific about the invitation that we offer to the audiences we care about and um, really make it something applicable um, provide some really like clear a discussion group um, an event something that's actually like something you can engage with as opposed to just reaching out, assuming that somebody would like to reach out, just kind of uh, overall, really generally, and offer offer some feedback or an opinion. Not everybody feels comfortable doing that, so I think we may inadvertently create these barriers to engagement just by assuming that other people will know what to do, and sometimes they don't. Thank you. And continuing on the practical side, and maybe this is a, a sore subject, but let's talk about business models. Like there is a component to communications and how communications are conceived 
by organizations or when you are a communicator as like your main your main role or your, your main business. So for your for what you know for your from your own experience, what business models make the most sense today for funding digital platforms in the ocean solution space? Mm. <laughs> Sam. A, I, I think this is a really difficult question. Um, my podcast is currently free and I don't get money for it, so <laughs> there is no business model except that um, I think that's exactly one of the, the troubles that um, on one hand, these it, it's beautiful that you can just start creating this type of platform for free. And it's incredibly important that it remains free for audiences um, because, I mean, if you don't know, you might be interested in a topic, why would you pay for it? Um, the thing that is often, I guess, or maybe not, I don't know, um, that gets a bit forgotten is it's incredibly time consuming to do digital um, content. Um, I think we spoke about this at our preparation meeting that, for example, you Liz think a ton about how you catch your audience's attention in the first like two seconds of your post or video, whereas I think a ton about how I present the visuals of my podcast, how I create a cover so that people even start looking at it and interacting with it. Um, and to then think about, and then you should do the editing, etc. And it's so time consuming and it's so, 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 so important that we do receive funding for it. And I keep walking around and telling people like, yeah, I, I don't do this for much longer if there's no partnerships, for example. But then at the same time, something I, um, I'm afraid of if I think about funding opportunities or like market, I don't know, advertisements, etc., is that you lose independence. So, for example, with a lot of podcasts, I think they're funded by specific organizations, etc., and you run into the sort of um, risk, I guess, that you lose a bit of independence around who can you have on the show, who can you talk to, and um, I try to have a lot of. Um, diverse voices on the podcast, but as soon as you start collaborating with, with someone, there's obviously a narrative to cover certain topics and to invite certain people, so it's difficult. <laughs> I, and I won't talk too much about business models, I guess, but maybe more about funding, funding models, and as somebody who's completed a lot of grant reports um, and also provides grants and thinks about reporting, um, I don't see like an earmark for communications, communicating the impact of results beyond reports, which are kind of fusty and end up in PDF littered folders on someone's random computer. Um, I would love to see a shift in the way we think about reporting on the work we do, and I'd love to see requirements on behalf of funders for um, providing a kind of sort of like public facing communications product about the work that we're doing. And I'd love to see support um, provided something we're thinking about related to storytelling and translating the complexity of the work that's going on, um, not just a requirement, right? So uh, that way, I think at the outset of projects, you're thinking about the end result, the end participant. Um, so all along that, that message is becoming more and more clear and when it comes time to actually share the progress you've made, like the pieces are already in place and you've, you've received the mentorship you need to know how to tell that story and, and land it with the, the right audiences. Um, so I think that many Ocean Solution startups often put communications not even in their budget until maybe a few years after. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity, like to really include communications in their initial budget, because that's the way that you can really scale your solutions and have uh, opportunities to meet new partnerships, especially with brands and private sector, public sector that want to change their operations right now. They need to, and they need these solutions, but they don't know who you are. And without the right communication strategy, like they're not gonna find you there unless they come to these conferences. So um, really putting that like into your initial plan and strategy, but also like using existing resources, um, even existing, like in my case, uh, content creators, there are so many who have these true, like trusted audiences um, and using their audiences and saying, hey, like, let's, let's make a network, let's make a hub, let's, let's, um, can you help share our stories and make a partnership or something and use what they have because they have the audience that believes in 
in what they have to say about creating positive ocean solutions. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so GreenWave is also a nonprofit um, and we are funded by private foundations, state and federal grants, corporate CSR contributions, and also individual donations. Um, but I will say that we, you know, we don't think of our hub as communications around programming. It is the programming. So it's not like a separate thing that funders can choose to fund or not. If they want to fund us and they want to fund our programming, they're probably going to end up funding the hub. Um, as far as, you know, if there were other digital platforms coming up, what I would recommend, I mean, I, I don't know what the best answer is, but I will say that you can't count, we, we shouldn't be asking farmers or, or people doing the ecosystem services to pay to get trained in the thing or to pay to get access to this material. I totally agree that this content has to stay free for those people who are doing the work um, and their margins are already too slim. They're really doing a public service here uh, in, in their day-to-day -day job. And so um, I think we should look for models where people, you know, either, either we agree that it's a public service and we figure out a way to fund it appropriately given that, or um, where the people who profit the most uh, financially from, you know, whatever the output is of the digital platform are the ones paying for it. I think just to add on to that, um, there's, I think in the US already really, really famous and very present um, the sites like Patreon. Um, there's a European equivalent called Steady. And I, for example, um, started putting my podcast on Steady because it allows people to like give you a membership a subscription while the content stays entirely free and it, it's kind of the option for people to support you on a regular basis um, without you necessarily having and remaining independent in that creation. Um, I think that's for me at least the, the business model that I would absolutely prefer to any other model. Um, and just to add on to something that you said Liz about uh, people not knowing about these topics unless they come to these conferences kudos to Ocean Visions. Many have probably seen me run around with my microphone because that's exactly what I'm thinking about. To, like, there's going to be an episode about certain um, snippets and, and topics of the conference because uh, not everybody can have the access to these types of conferences. And um, lastly, I think everybody that comes on a podcast, and I can, I can just speak on it um, from this perspective, is incredibly excited and happy and honored to, to do so. Um, but there needs to be a turnaround in that perception, I think, um, for the guests to then also understand, okay, we need our respective budgets to reflect that and to um, have specific uh, funding for, for these types of, um, of platforms. Yes. And um, so, like, using creators and artists are a way to provide a marketing service as well. You don't need to only, like, hire a marketing or communications company to help with you. Help uh, use creators to share your stories, like, for a podcast or a video or, or um, like, a youth network or something, because they already have audiences again. So, yeah, that's a marketing service in itself. You can kind of, like, decentralize that as well. It doesn't have to be that company who necessarily pays you for... Um, your your creation or for my podcast, etc. But it mm -hmm. kind of needs to come full circle in a sense. And I think we also spoke about this in our preparation meeting is that there's a lot of different, you can't just put all your strategy into one platform because the types of people who, who, who watch um, or use and interact with one specific platform are super different from, um, they, they vary, like everybody has their preferences. So to, to diversify that as well is super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also, I love that point about artists and really thinking outside the box. I think we get caught up thinking about like the post, like the words that we're saying. And it's like, what are you creating that is worth that post? Um, and I think behind that, there's something interesting, right? The multimedia approach, what, you know, can you create something, an audio piece? Can you make a mural? I don't know, just work with some some folks that are in the in the community that you're, you're targeting to find somebody who's already there doing something really beautiful and memorable, and that's something worth talking about. Um, and then just the, the argument for marketing, even as like a, a starting, like a little budget, it is, it's easy to make the return on investment really, it just, it kind of starts flowing in, I would say pretty, 
pretty quickly. You can't get media talking about what you're doing if it doesn't make sense on your website. Um, and if you're not showing up in places where you can talk about it. And I consider speaking about the work that we do a huge piece of marketing that I think we under train and under support ourselves to do. Just being able to kind of competently describe what we're doing and take questions on it. That's really hard. And I think the being able to do that successfully comes from developing an awesome content strategy about what you're doing and the problems you're approaching that makes sense both to you and to people who've never heard of what we're talking about. Thank you so much for this. And now we have time for two questions. Uh, please use the opportunity. I think it's uh, convenient now that we have these fabulous experts in our panel. Is this on? Good. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you all for being here. My name is Andy. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Clean Planet. We, were, we started in Colombia on the notion of trash cleanups um, individually in communities and have been just having this conversation re recently of how do we expand beyond just simply cleaning nature and we've turned to digital platforms and I, I'm clueless in this world so I, I really appreciate this conversation of storytelling, right, because that's what moves us as human beings and also this point of how do we have a specified call to action when we want to engage. So I'm just wondering if you have examples of calls to action for your communities that have really resulted in, in engagement and people taking on things for themselves. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, thank you. It sounds like really fascinating work. Um, I have found the concept of mentorship and reciprocal mentorship to be something that's pretty interesting to folks um, around specific topics like themes. If you're looking to skill build around, I'll just like fundraising, for example, pulling in a mentor um, who is really skilled in that area and bringing in people that are actually working towards that challenge um, and an inviting conversation that both benefits this mentor from learning about what new challenges maybe people are facing now and then of course providing that opportunity for knowledge to flow from the mentor to the mentee so that's something that we've found to be successful I, I think like broadly events like even small ones I think we psych ourselves out and think events are like really huge like this not every event has to happen at a gorgeous aquarium right we can do like a little zoom panel with maybe a couple of friends that you know that have an expertise maybe other people may want to learn from so that's kind of low-hanging fruit and you can learn really quickly like what connects and what doesn't um, and iterate from there but I, I do like events as a, a starting point also I would like to add to that um building like challenges I think people really like to be engaged in a way that's some fun so if they have like a month goal like here are 10 things that you can do by this month if you if you succeeded like you change your you can change your daily habits and continue on or um i mean besides from people like to sign campaigns and be part of a, a movement but i think having like a challenge of like 10 actions or something and having people from your team expressing uh, showing their daily um their daily efforts and the action to keep the uh, awareness and mo motivation um, and also partnering, like reaching out to cool organizations that are doing something similar, but in a different way, like the River Cleanup, who has these nets and rivers, and they've helped collect, like stop the pollution from going into the oceans. And so if you were to like work with organizations doing something similar, but different in a way that it adds for both of you, um, it could be really nice. Sam, do you want to add something? Okay. Um. I guess I would say that one thing that Greenwave has focused on doing is um, sort of creating structure around the year, like creating ant times of year when you take certain actions and, and sort of reminding people of that each year. Like now is the time when we do this, whether it's working with prospective seaweed buyers to remind them that, you know, farmers are going to plant in the fall. So if you're interested in changing up your sourcing strategy to incorporate regeneratively farmed seaweed, like do it now. Um, so that's that's a very, you know, tangible supply chain call to action. But we also uh, on the platform this past uh, January held our first ever how to start a kelp farm course, which was a, 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 a like a it was open to anyone. And it was a guided tour through our content. So we didn't change the content at all, but we kind of created um, programming around it and we gave people a structure for engaging with it over a period of six weeks as opposed to having them you know do it on their own 
which can, you know, it's how many of us have tried to stick with an exercise routine and fallen off of that. So it's really helpful to have the community with you for that and to have a structure for, for taking action. We have another question. This will be the last question. Sorry, we're running out of time. Hi, guys. I'm Marley. I'm interning with Ocean Visions. I really appreciate you guys coming to speak today. It's been very informative. But I graduate college in May, and I'm really interested in getting into the science communications field and with education and outreach. And just as people already in the area, what would your advice be to young professionals trying to break into the field? There's like so many resources, but also it's overwhelming. I totally understand that. Um, actually, recently I know that the ECOP, the Early Career Ocean Professions, they recently started a node in, in the US. And um, yeah, so it takes some research and seeing opportunities, but also just sometimes offering some, um, bringing your own ideas, like trying whatever makes you happy and sharing it with the rest of the world. And you'll be very surprised how you'll find people interested and happy and supporting you. And um, just like they always say in content creation, like consistency is key. So keeping consistent with a passion that enlightens you and inspires you to keep people motivated. And um, you'll slowly like see that people feel the same. And yeah, <laughs> I don't know, it's hard. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. It's an exciting point that I think resonated with all of us. Um, you also have a really amazing skill set that's kind of innate because we're at this interesting generational moment where we've grown up with some of these tools that really define success or failure for initiatives. Um, so I wouldn't undervalue just the knowledge that you have as a communications professional from just being around and starting to work and going through school and learning these platforms and what resonates with you. All that knowledge is really applicable even in a really specific area like the ocean space. It might not feel that way, but it is. Um, and I would also say having some examples of organizations, when you look at the comms work that they've done and it feels amazing to you, keep those in your back pocket. Pay attention to what they do and what it is maybe about their content that's resonant. Um, people may ask you about that in interviews, um, but it's, it's also useful just to watch as they evolve over the years, like how are they changing? And you can take some cool kind of best practices from orgs like that. I think also to add on to that um, is, I don't know if this is fortunate or unfortunate, but I guess most of us have started doing our work because we were particularly interested in one form of expression or one form of communication. Um, and to find that one uh, form that, that you are passionate about, whether that is writing, whether that is um, podcasting, interviewing, video creation and then um, starting to, to, to create that and um, proposing that to organizations, especially in writing. I've heard that um, people who are journalists, who are um, writing articles regarding science communication, if you actually contact people and ask, hey, are you interested in um, having someone write about this and this topic, they will be like, I, I don't know, I, maybe if you send me something. So I guess just immediately saying like, hey, here's my piece or hey, here's my file. Um, and starting out, unfortunately, by doing it for free, but then um, uh, proposing it to people. And I'm, I'm, th that's how, how, this, how I got here. Like I just had my podcast and was like, hey, I could do a podcast episode about the summit. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the main um, areas, uh, uh, modes of entry, I, I would suggest. So. Uh, just, I would say just get your feet wet any way you can. And, and I do mean that literally. I do think that uh, one thing that is always beneficial if you're communicating about a thing is to have some experience actually doing it. Um, and so if, if you, know, you want to do science about ocean farming, see if you can help out an ocean farmer for a little bit. I think it'll make everything just click into place a little bit better in your brain, which um, will help you communicate it that much better to everyone else. Thank you. And so last few things, um, we will have the podcast that, uh, Anna is, uh, putting together that will come out at some point next week, probably. <laughs> yep. Uh, so that, that will be uh, one way to relieve the highlights of, uh, this wonderful conference and you can also follow uh, Liz, who has been producing some content about the, the conference. 
And to finalize, I will put you on the spot um, for, say, yeah, 30 seconds each for your own call for action, whatever that it is at this moment. Regarding Ocean or our respective platforms? <laughs> you choose. I can go quickly. Um, I think I'm always so energized at these events, um, just for meeting folks and getting to be here in person and make these connections. Um, so I would love if we continued conversations after afterwards, which you always say, I can't wait to talk to you on LinkedIn. I can't wait to have a Zoom with you and it never happens. So I would challenge, challenge us to actually follow through with those and continue building momentum, kind of pull those collaborative collaborative strings a little bit and see, see what we can do if we follow through with the interesting conversations we've started here. I would say um, to, to add on to that, um, if you feel like you know someone um, who should be presenting their work on a podcast, reach out to me um, <laughs> and we can talk about that and folk featuring that conversation. Um, and I think make sure to find the right platform for whatever you're trying to, to communicate. Um, once again, I think for example, the podcast is a great way to explain and, and, and make people aware of um, carbon dioxide removal. I think the uh, Instagram is a great way to for a call for action, as you as you um, painted so so nicely. So I think find the right platform for the story that you think you need to tell and and reach out. And I would share. Um, we're all here because we care about the ocean, but so much of the world doesn't know that they should or how to care about the ocean. So try to target ways that you communicate what you're doing to someone who probably has no idea and really making that, making all these amazing scientific data and, and work and, and research we're doing into stories uh, because people are, at the end of the day are going to remember the stories that we share, not so much the numbers. Um, so use that in mind when you're trying to get people around the world to care about what you're doing because they can care if you say it in the right way. Sam. My call to action is to register for the Green Wave Hub, greenwave.org slash hub. It is free and available to everyone and I would love to see you all in the community and to chat with you there. Thank you so Follow much. Follow us. Okay. And um, so please, uh, Give a round of applause, applause, sorry, for this wonderful panel. And um, thank you so much for coming today.